They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9.09 Wednesday, March 2nd. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And it's March, baby. Spring is right around the corner. Another sunny intro from your boy. There you go, Joe. Love those sunny intros. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. I got today's Wordle Word in three guesses, and I'm pretty damn proud of myself. <laughs> uh, Brian DiNato, Franklin Avi Quine. La- I thought yesterday's Wordle Word was kind of ridiculous. I don't want to give Well, I guess now there are no spoilers, but it wasn't my favorite one. I did get it, but I think that should be a proper name. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The Keeneland Spring Meet returns April 8th through the 29th. New Keeneland Select accounts that wager $300 in the first 30 days earn $100 back with their sign-up bonus. You can visit KeenelandSelect.com to sign up. So unfortunately, there was a lot of news on the Baffert front this week. Uh, We finally got the lawsuit that we were expecting. Uh, He he sued Churchill Downs Incorporated and Bill Carstangen, who is the CEO uh, as well as CD, as well as Churchill board chair Alex Rankin, in order to try to stay in, in the Derby picture and be able to run in the Derby. Also, he uh, made his appeal to the, for, on the KHRC suspension to a Kentucky administrative law judge, saying, "quote Without a stay of his suspension, the KHRC suspension will effectively put me out of business." Which I have a lot to say about that. But Bill, I'm curious what your response is to these, you know, expected but you know, pretty important law proceedings. Yeah, absolutely. And everything was expected. And let me um, say one thing. Well, well, it's it's fresh on the hot burner. He said, well, put me out of business. No, it's not going to. None of this is going to come even close to putting him out of business because he can still run it at most major racetracks in the country. And even if he does serve a lengthy suspension, owners will flock back to him when it's over. So I understand, you know, hyperbole in these cases is, is uh Common, but the problem for Baffert now is that you know obviously everything is focused on the short-term goal of getting into the Kentucky Derby. Uh, he's got Messier. We'll talk later about New Grange, who, who kind of uh, uh, didn't uh, run well in the Rebel. But it's Baffert. He's got four or five horses that are that are Derby bound. The problem that he has now is that he has to clear not one but two very big hurdles to be able to get into the Derby. So let's suppose he gets a the, the judge in Kentucky. And by the way, um, as we are recording this, the hearing in Kentucky is ongoing. Um, we don't expect a, a decision today, but our intrepid reporter, Katie Petruniak, is in the courthouse and she'll be filling in all the TDN readers uh, later today. And of course, tomorrow when, when um, they wake up and, and, and read their TDN for that. But he's got two hurdles to clear. If he wins in Kentucky court, and gets a stay that prevents Churchill from banning him, he still has the Kentucky Racing Commission suspension, which runs from March 8th for three months and would uh, would take him out of the entire Triple Crown. If he gets uh, a stay over that suspension from Kentucky, he could still potentially have the Churchill ban. So it's getting down to crunch time. There are two things he's dealing with at once, two different balls up in the air. And unless he gets a stay or an injunction or a temporary restraining order or whatever you want to say on not just one, but both of these matters, he's not going to compete in the Kentucky Derby. And, you know, predicting this is, is obviously a little bit difficult, especially for guys like us who are not lawyers and want to, you know, set our hair on fire because all we talk about anymore is lawsuits and legal things. But I would have to say, based on the fact that he's got two very high hurdles to clear, I don't think Bob Baffert's competing in this year's Kentucky Derby. And that, again, raises the question that we've been asking for months and has we have no answers to whatsoever what happens to his horses like Messier, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's a lot to happen in a short window. And, you are you know, we've kind of been waiting to see when these owners were going to blink and make a decision and make a change. And, I mean, at this point, it seems like that's just not going to happen. And I guess they're just willing to forego the one race and figure they can you know, win a lot of other races, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, personally, I'm a little tired of like talking about this. I don't know how you cover it, Bill. You do all these stories and TD and and it's just like, I couldn't, I don't know how you write 2000 words about it every day. Not fun, Brian. (laughs) I'm tired of talking about it on the show every week. That's for damn sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I get that it's like Bill said, it's hyperbole and it's, 
you know, you kind of have to exaggerate your arguments for the for the public and for the court. But I'm just I'm getting a little tired of of the the Bob Baffert's career is in your hands plea to every single judge. And it's just it's such a joke is like everything, everything they say about the potential damage to his career from suspensions is just a farce. The idea that Bob Baffert is going to go out of business if he's suspended for 90 days. It's just so patently ridiculous. Like, I don't I don't really know what to say, but. You know, if if nothing else, Bob Baffert's owners have shown that they're fiercely loyal to him. They have not moved any of their horses really out of his barn, despite it being two months basically to the Derby and them having no points. So the idea that all these people aren't going to go running back to him, even if he has to has to serve the ninety days, is is pretty laughable to me. But you know, and also he's not hurting for money, as you can tell by him paying his lawyers to file lawsuits every single day. You know, Craig Robertson's. Kids have probably gone through school over the past, just from from the past year of, of lawyer fees. And, you know, it's just it, it continues this kind of narrative for, for him. And I think that's what pisses people off more than anything. It's not even really the drug positives. It's that he just can never take responsibility for this. That's the big problem for me. It's always he's the victim. This is just something that's happening to him. You know, it's not the result of his actions. And that that to me is really frustrating. It's just, you know, he just has this like this inability to just ever take responsibility and even serve a single day of a suspension. Like, I think if he took the 90 days and just said, you know, I screwed up, you know, I think the testing limits are are too uh, sensitive, but nevertheless, I broke the rules. I'm going to go away for a little bit. I'll be back. I think people would mostly be okay with that and would be more willing to welcome him, him back into the fold, but it's just this constant, constant obstinance and just refusal to ever face any consequences for his actions. I think it rubs a lot of people the wrong way, but he's never going to change. You know, it's just that's why this this process goes on and on and on and on and on, because he just refuses to take responsibility. Don't you think, Bill? Yeah, I I do. And that is I I don't think obviously from the time that he started this, when he did those first press conferences and then went on the uh, cancel culture tour, uh, he has not uh, done a good job handling this from a public relations standpoint. And basically he shut up. Uh, I mean, his actions speak, but he doesn't speak literally in words, Um, you know, for quite some time now. he has not had anything to say on this. And I'm sure the lawyers finally said to him that, you know, Bob, you're hurting yourself here. Let, let, let's keep quiet. Um, I want to piggyback off something Brian said, though. And and I would have thought, you know, he said that his owners haven't blinked and they, they haven't. And I would have thought at this point, you know, that van from uh, Bob Baffert's barn straight to Todd Fletcher's barn with about seven Kentucky Derby contenders would have already been rolling out of the gates of Santa Anita. But um, and I'm very surprised. And, and maybe this is just loyalty to Baffert. And, you know, loyalty is not such, I mean, I would disagree with them, but, you know, there's something to be said for being loyal to a guy and sticking by him. But I don't think they have gotten to the point yet where they have to blink because we're dealing now, there's basically in, in the, during the three-year-old season, three rounds of derby preps. And you go from, say, at, uh, in California, you go from like the Robert B. Lewis is round one, San Felipe's round two, and then the San Diego Derby. The, the big preps, San Diego Derby, Arkansas Derby, Bluegrass, Wood Memorial, et cetera, have yet to be run. You can run in just those races. And, and so far as from a point standpoint, even if you finish second or third, you're going to get enough points to get into the Derby. So I think, you know, Baffert has preached to his owners give me a chance here. I'm going to get this overturned. And they're sticking by because they don't have to blink yet. Now, it could be that they will just say the heck with the Kentucky Derby. We'll just run in the Preakness. And, and you know, all you people in Kentucky that are going after our friend Baffert, you can go to hell. Um, but I, it, it, that hasn't been determined yet. We'll see. And uh, again, I don't think that they have to blink for the San Felipe, but the California contingent does have to blink before the Santa Anita Derby. The Arkansas contingent does have to blink before the Arkansas Derby. And if they don't, and Baffert doesn't win all his legal lawsuits, then we are not going to see these horses in the Kentucky Derby. But I still think there's going to, I still think they'll be there uh, probably with another trainer, but we'll see. Now, Bill, what's the likelihood? I mean, I know you said before, you're not a lawyer either. How likely do you think this is all to shake out in like the three weeks it needs to shake out in? You know, up till like this week, I would have said quite possibly. But now looking at it, like I said, with so much, he's got to fight off so much. And, you know, the other thing, too, that we haven't talked about uh, is that both the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission and Churchill Downs, they are like taking no crap here. And, you know, they suspended Baffert for 90 days 
And I don't think any of us saw that coming. We thought it would be the typical 15 day now suspension. Now they've made it the 90 days because they uh, uh, said that it was the fourth violation and it's an escalating scale of, of, uh, uh, of, of things. Then uh, they denied his stay of suspension, which I was really surprised there because, you know, I like his ro lawyer, Craig Robinson, said this is unprecedented. I don't know if it's unprecedented or not, but I can't recall a situation where a guy has appealed a suspension, uh, particularly for a, you know, fairly innocuous drug. It's not a performance enhancing drug. And they haven't said, yeah, you get a stay, go on and train and we'll, we'll worry about this as it proceeds through the courts. And then Churchill, I mean, they put out a press release yesterday. I use the word scathing in my my writing in the Thoroughbred Daily News. I mean, th this is not, th they're, nobody's playing nice here anymore. I mean, they are, the comments are loud, bold, their actions are bold. So neither the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission nor Churchill Downs is going to showing any signs that they're going to roll over here. So, um, you know, again, everything could change and maybe it'll change by this afternoon when Katie writes her story out of Kentucky court. But right now, um, I think, especially with, with the time frame we're dealing with, I don't think things look good for him. Yeah, I mean, and you know, that's why he has to make these arguments to try to persuade a judge that maybe is not as well versed in racing to, to believe this idea that this is going to end his career. Because if he says that to the KHRC or to Churchill Downs, you know, it's it's complete. They they know the sport and they know how ridiculous that is. They know that he has 30, 40 you know, decades in the business built up that's not going to go away in just 90 days. So he has, he has to have these hyperbolic arguments to try to convince maybe these not so well versed in racing judges uh, to be on his side. But, you know, Bill mentioned the scathing statement. I'll read it. This is the response from Churchill Downs Incorporated after he read Bob Baffert finally filed suit against him. It says the lawsuit filed by Bob Baffert is disappointing, but certainly not surprising. His claims are meritless and consistent with his pattern of failed drug tests, denials, excuses and attempts to blame others and identify loopholes in order to avoid taking responsibility for his actions. These actions have harmed the reputations of the Kentucky Derby, Churchill Downs and the entire thoroughbred racing industry. Churchill Downs will fight this baseless lawsuit and defend our company's rights. What's at stake here is the integrity of our races, the safety of, of horses, and the trust of the millions of fans and bettors who join us every year on the first Saturday in May. That says to me that they are ready. They are ready to take, if Bob Baffert really wants to go this, this route and take them to court, Churchill Downs, I'm sure, has just as good lawyers as Bob Baffert does, if not more. And they've been, they've been preparing for this all along. And the same thing with the KHRC. You know, I'm, I'm sure that they have been pre preparing for his rebuttal all along. Maybe, maybe that's why it took them nine and a half months to make a ruling. I'm not going to speculate on that. But honestly, this Bob Baffert, I think, has has antagonized his way out of a lot of stuff in this industry for a long time. I don't know that he's going to be able to do it this time, especially because he doesn't. I don't think he has a leg to stand on with the KHRC ruling. Doesn't as far as I'm I, as I've read, it doesn't matter if the the drug was in his, was on, in his blood because of an ointment or because of an injection. Doesn't matter. He tested positive. And with the Churchill Downs thing, they're a private company and they can take him off the grounds if they want. They don't have to go through the whole governmental process that Naira did. And I just think he's 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 kind of out of luck at this point. Joe, I want to add to that, and I want to focus in on the the latest one, the, the lawsuit against Churchill Downs. And again, I have to preface this every time. I'm not a lawyer, and maybe lawyers would tell me that I'm dead wrong on this, but I don't think I well, am. It sounds like a little uh, thing over your head that's yeah, right, right, yeah, right. right. all times. Um, but his con the lawyer's contention was, okay, you can't ban him because you denied him his due process rights. And, oh, by the way, only the Racing Commission can ban him. Um, again, from my uh, layman standpoint, but I, you know, I'm getting an education on this. That's just wrong. Yeah. I, I mean, there's no legal precedence that that I can see that that they back up these statements. And matter of fact, every single time, uh, by and large, this has come before courts. They have said that uh, a private racetrack can throw out anybody anytime they want, as long as it's not race, breed, color, religion, etc. Um, and they don't have to give anybody due process. And, I, you know, to say that only the racing commission, which banned him anyways, by the way, exactly. can ban him again, you know, that that goes against everything that has been tried in the courts over the years. So, you know, it, it's a little bit of a Hail Mary, but, you know, uh, I, I guess that uh, it is fourth and 40 for them and then they're going to throw Hail Marys. Yeah, it's pretty funny. The racing. Well, the racing commission is the only, is the only people that could ban me. Well, what they do? 
Well, they just banned me for 90 days. <laughs> Shouldn't have brought that up. Right. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Nominations for this year's Toyota Bluegrass and Ashland Stakes. On opening weekend of Keeneland's spring meet have been posted. The Bluegrass, back to being a grade one this year, as it always should have been, attracted 121 nominees, including the 1-2 finishers in the Risen Star, Epicenter, and Smile Happy. The race is scheduled for Saturday, April 10th, and will be televised on NBC. The Ashland drew 99 three-year-old Philly nominees, including champion Echo Zulu. Looking forward to seeing her back on the track. And grade two, Rachel Alexandra Stakes winner, Turner Loose. The Ashland will be run on opening day, Friday, April 9th. And we're super excited for the Keeneland meet. As always, it's right around the corner, probably four or five weeks away at this point. Can't wait to watch it. Can't wait to hopefully be there at some point during the meet. And uh, as always, it's going to be a ton of great, high-quality racing. Looking forward to it. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. The Eclipse Awards are a recognition of greatness. And the Eclipse Award goes to Corniche. Wow, how sweet it is. At Malathat, she was a breath of fresh air. And a special thank you to Echo Zulu. Jackie's Warrior. He's a spectacular horse. We're grateful for them. They win Horse of the Year, Nick's Go, 2021. It has been an incredible journey. Such an important award. Congratulations, each of you, on this amazing accomplishment. It was just put together like a machine, and he had a great mind. Everything about him was what you'd want. Tis the law pops the cork in the champagne. Tis the law is going to win the first leg of the Triple Crown. I've never seen him get tired. Respect the law. Tis the law. His structure is just perfect. His bone is perfect. He's left the others behind. He's going to win the run, Happy Travers. He's everything you would look for in a horse. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore Classic Empire at his 12th winner of the year last week when Classic State of Mind won an allowance optional claimer at Gulfstream by two and a half lengths. Classic Empire sits second only to Cupid. A <laughs> number number of winners in twenty two among second in twenty twenty two among second crop sires. He's also the sire of three stakes performers led by stakes winner Morello so far this year. And Coolmore America is off to a great start with their second crop sires. Practical Joe Caravaggio, classic Empire Cupid, of course, but it's also an exciting time as they welcome the first foals from Tis the Law, Echo Town, and Maximum Security. A lot of big things going on with the sires down in Ashford. So the big racing over the weekend was at Oaklawn Park. We had the Rebel and the Honey Bee. Uh, it was two pretty different performances. We had one blowout win from a really nice, really heavily favored three-year-old filly. And then we had a, a close win by a 75 to one shot. The track changed a lot in between the races as well. So it's tough to compare those two races. Uh, Secret Oath, the filly I was referring to, got a 92 buyer. Love, love seeing the Arrogate filly do well. Uh, obviously a great story for Dean Wayne Lucas. Just chatter about her maybe running in the Arkansas Derby, particularly since Un Ojo, the long shot who won the, the Rebel, only got an 84 buyer. Don't know how much you can really read into that. Well, let's get some first reactions from Bill and, and Brian. Well, I, I mean, the story obviously is Wayne Lucas. I mean, what a day for him, secret oath. And then he almost pulls off a win in the Arkansas Derby uh, a, as well. Um, you know, and then he can't, help but not root for Lucas. Uh, you know, the guy has been an icon in this industry for so long. And, you know, it's not just him when he's 86 years old. And when trainers get into this neighborhood, um, the, the owners tend to, to just say, you know, I'm going to go find somebody younger and that sort of thing. And, you know, I every week, I, I every time she's raced, I, I've tried to beat her. I think she's going to bounce and, and go backwards. And she just keeps going and going and going. And I don't know if she beat the very best field in that race, but she, you know, the way she did it, though, she really, it was, you know, as, as Vic's offered a little bit of hyperbole, said, here is a superstar coming to the wire. Vic, I don't know go, that doesn't sound yeah. like Vic. I don't know if I would go that far, but nonetheless, she is really, really good. And, you know, the story becomes, Ken, in this, you know, one of the last hurrahs in his long, illustrious uh, career, can Wayne Lucas pull off a win in the um, uh, Kentucky Oaks? Uh, and then the, the, the story becomes a, a few hours later, uh, and I'm sorry to do this. Please, somebody help me. I don't remember the name of the horse of his that ran second. Um, Ethereal Road? Ethereal Road, exactly. So then Ethereal Road looks like he's going to win the race and gets nipped on the wire by this impossible long shot, Uno Ojo. Now, I, I think that the relevance there is that I think that Ethereal Road, having run well, is probably going to mean that Lucas is not going to run Secret Oath against the boys in the Arkansas Derby because he doesn't need to right now. Now, he has this history of running, uh, you know, back in the day of running fillies against boys, including he won the uh, 
the um, Arkansas Derby with Althea many moons ago, uh, a filly there. But, um, you know, she's really, really good. And we'll see what happens in her next start, which I assume will be the fantasy. And then we'll see what Lucas does with his three-year-old cult as well, a three-year-old road. But, uh, you know, fascinating story. Like most people, um, I don't think the Rebel is going to produce uh, a Kentucky Derby contender. I think the race really came up poor. Newgrange, the big favorite for our friend Bob Baffert, did not run a step. And then, um, you know, you had some sort of impossible long shots, first and second on the wire. But a good story, the one-eyed horse from a little trainer out of Louisiana that nobody ever heard of, you know, no, oh, we'll be following that. And not to heap more praise on you today, Bill, but I thought your D. Wayne story before the race was a really good. Well, thank you. I think if, if anyone who hasn't read that, go back and check it out. Just some great quotes from D. Wayne. Um, I mean, she's Secret Oath is really good. I don't know why every time a Philly wins a couple races, we all of a sudden have to talk about will she take on the boys? Um, I don't know. I mean, she's beaten some pretty lackluster fields in those two races. Obviously, she's doing it in fast time, and you know she can't control who she's beating, but. Um, I'm not so sure against, you know, the, the best Colts, if she'd really stack up and, and win that kind of race. Um, I was a little surprised to, that they brought Newgrange back for that race. I know he won the previous race there, but he never looked comfortable over that track. And they even said after the race, you know, it didn't look like he was handling it. So I thought it was a little surprising to send him back to Oakland to run another prep. Um, and it, you know, he never really looked comfortable in this race either. Um, it'll be interesting to see if and when and how he bounces back. Um, also, which you mentioned, we talked to Ricky Corville, the, the trainer of Una Ojo. Uh, I'll start with him. Yeah, it was just such an improbable win for a, a guy like him, who honestly I, I hadn't heard of I, before, on, before Saturday's race. Um, but he's, he's been training in, in Arkansas and, and the kind of Texarkana area for, for since, I think, 2008. His last win prior to the Rebel came October 28th, so basically four months since he had won a race. Uh, in his seven starts prior to the Rebel, none of his horses ran better than sixth. Uh, he earned more money for the Rebel purse than he had in any entire year <laughs> since he began began training. He never won six hundred thousand dollars in earnings in a year before. In twenty twenty, just two years ago, his stable earned less than two hundred thousand for the year. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to redboard here and say that I liked this horse, but. I don't think he should have been 75 to one. You know, he was only 20, 12 to one on the morning line. And it's not as if he hadn't run well in stakes before. They, they shipped the horse up to New York and all he did was run second in a pair of stakes at 23 to one, 28 to one. And I kind of want to mention that because I think that's the other notable thing about this win is that is what it may say about the Withers, in which I think on, on this show, we all agreed that early voting looked really good visually, but he only got a, a 78 buyer for the race. Unoho, Unoho is the only horse from the Withers to run back so far, and he improved his buyer figure 13 points. And if you go back and look at the form of the horses behind him and early voting and the Withers, a lot of horses, like an unbelievable amount, ran below par, like sometimes lifetime low numbers. So I think that's a figure that we might see adjusted upward in the future. Um, it was the only nine furlong race that run that day at Aqueducts. Those are always kind of tricky figures to make. And I think the other horses out of that race will – provide value overall when, when they run back. As for Secret Oath, she beat a really weak field in the Honey Bee, and she had some tense moments on the far turn. She kind of got unnecessarily boxed in by her rider, I thought. Uh, but once the rail opened up, the race was over, which is you know why I'm not sure the jockey had to continue hitting her in the last 16th of a mile, but that's neither here nor there. She's obviously very nice. She's won her last three races by a combined 23 lengths now. Great story, as Bill said, being trained by the now 86-year-old Wayne Lucas. I uh, also love the fact that Arrogate has a potential start three-year-old, as I mentioned before. I was so excited for him as a stallion. And he died so young that it's, it's super important for him to get some nice horses and first few crops to at least carry on his, his bloodline. You know, the caveat is she beat a nothing field and, you know, is the top of what looks like a pretty subpar three-year-old filly class so far. But And she also looks like a totally different horse at, at Oaklawn for whatever that's worth in terms of going on to the Oaks or the Derby. I honestly think it makes sense to run her in the Arkansas Derby, considering what we've seen in the Arkansas prep races so far. Um, and the other nice thing about having a horse like her, obviously trained by Wayne, is you know you're going to get to see her run. You know he's not going to duck any races or, or tell you the horse only he's going to run four or five times the entire year for for no reason. So you know, overall, it's it was it was a lot. It was a couple of nice stories on Saturday. You know when there were there were some not so nice stories earlier in the day. We didn't even talk about about the. The Saudi Cup, and we had uh, Emre Zidane defending Bob Baffert on that 
te telecast, but I think it was a little bit of a palate cleanser for a lot of people later in the day to see Wayne Lucas and this 75 to one one eyed long shot uh, win in Oakland Park kind of kind of reminds you, who, you know, who, who, who the good and bad guys in this game was was kind of on, on display, at least for me on, on Saturday. But looking forward to see, seeing what Secret Oath does next for sure. Lane's End Stallion of the Week this week is West Coast. Champion three-year-old and son of Flatter has his first two-year-olds this year. Stands for $15,000 at Lane's End. Our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, who Bill mentioned is our court reporter for the day. She was in Ocala last week and spoke with several consigners uh, who were really impressed with their West Coast two-year-olds. I suggest you read that story. I think it's going to have several parts. It's the first impressions of these freshman sires from Katie and from some people down at OBS. It's a really good story. Uh, Eddie Woods, in particular, spoke, spoke highly of one West Coast colt out of Kimono who's going to the OBS March sale. Uh, I think we have footage of, of him, and we look forward to seeing those West Coast hit the track this year. We'll be right back after this message from Lane's End. Accelerate, a five-time grade one winner with over six million in earnings. In 2018 alone, he won the Santa Anita Handicap, the Gold Cup, the Pacific Classic by a record-setting 12 and a half lengths, the awesome again, and bested a world-class field in the Breeders' Cup Classic. A grandson of legendary Lanes and Stallion Smart Strike, Accelerate stands to continue his grandsire's legacy at Lanes End. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year-round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all-time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Brats. Breed them. Raise them. Race them. We all win. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders. It was a big day for Kentucky Breds, as it always is on a big day anywhere across the world. At the Saudi Cup, Emblem Road led home a Kentucky Bred trifecta in the world's richest race, $20 million on the line. It's Country Grammar and Midnight Bourbon coming in second and third, respectively. Then on the undercard, Kentucky Bred Pinehurst won the $1.5 million grade three, Group 3 Saudi Derby. You can find your next Kentucky Bred at the upcoming two-year-old sales, starting with the OBS March sale, March 15th through the 16th. As I mentioned, we didn't really know that much about Ricky Corville, the winner of, of the Rebel with Unaho, but he's an interesting guy. We talked to him yesterday, me, Bill, and John. Uh, obviously a major, major seismic win for his career. Um, we're really happy for him. Honestly, it's great to see these, these smaller trainers pop up and win these big races once in a while. So check out our interview with Ricky Corville. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we're thrilled to bring on this week as the Green Group Guest of the Week, uh, the winner of the Rebel Stakes on Saturday, Ricky Corville. Thanks for so much for coming on. Thank y'all for having me. So first of all, congratulations on the big win. It's it's an unbelievable accomplishment to win a race like that at Oakland Park. But I have to confess, I don't know that much about you and, and your background. So why don't you just give us the Cliff Notes version on how you ended up training a horse like Unoho? Well, uh, actually, I worked for the owners like for, life, for 20 years off and on. I ran the farm down for the breeders. Uh, and I was a jockey for like 15 years from up until two. 2001, uh, I quit riding and went to work for them. And I've always kind of broke the babies and trained some of the horses that didn't really cut it uh, up north. So, and they sent them back down to Louisiana. So. And then last year, I've been breaking all the babies for uh, Mr. Moody again. Ricky, thanks for joining us. And at any point in your career, did you allow yourself to believe that you'd win a million dollar horse race with a horse that's probably on the way to Kentucky Derby? No, not to the last couple of years. Having the uh, babies for Mr. Moody, they were. You know, the caliber of horses he has right now. You know, I didn't know I would have him. You know, we usually send him off. So I just got lucky to get him back, you know. Yep. And and one of the amazing things about the horseman, I obviously, he's, he's got one eye, which has captured the imagination of everybody. But what people don't realize also is that his first race out, he lost by 24 lengths. His next time out, he won by four you know, half lengths. I mean, a 28 length turnaround is a huge turnaround from one race to another. When did you start believing this horse had this kind of talent? 
Well, when you we always knew he had talent, but then we sent him up to Keeneland on a trip with another horse, and uh, he wasn't a six for a long horse. It was kind of more or less a schooling for him. 14 hour band ride, went up there two days out, ran, and he just not a six for a long horse. And then when we brought him back, we waited till they ran two turns at Delta, and he just he went easy that day. So. Question about the, the, the training schedule, because I know he went to Tony Dutro when he was up north at Aqueduct. What's the plan going forward? Are you going to continue to train this horse, or is it going to go back and forth between you and Tony? What's the plan? As of right now, it's kind of up in the air. You know, I, I think the horse is going to maybe stay down here, but it's not confirmed yet. And We're we hoping to keep him. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Ricky, back to the situation with the one eye. Does that affect him any way when he runs? Is there anything you have to do a little bit differently with him? That you might not, not do with other horses. Running, he's fine. You know, mm-hmm. and I handle him around the barns different. You know, you just got to watch it because it's it's on the side you handle him from on the on the left side. Uh, actually, when he first came in, he was really really timid, and and he would brush up on you on anything you did. He was he put himself against you where he could feel you, you know, because he couldn't mm-hmm. see. You. He wouldn't walk on the side. He'd walk behind you and nudge you with his nose the whole way around the barn and stuff like that. But on on the track when he was first, he was it took him a long time to really get comfortable. You know, he pooped from everything and he was just maturing late and and but once he started run, running, I don't see any problem with it. He'll go inside, outside, you know, it don't matter to him. So so, so walk us through your thoughts and, and emotions as you're standing in the paddock for the rebel, you know, uh you got Baffert's got a horse in there. Asmussen's got a couple of horses in there. D. Wayne Lucas has got a horse in there. And you look up at the at the board and you're 50, 60, 70 to one. What are you saying to yourself? And, and also, what are you saying to the jockey, uh, you know, before the race? What instructions did you give him? Well, actually, I wasn't there. My son was there for the race. I was still in Louisiana. Uh, wife got hurt, broke her leg, asked the boots for it. Uh, she was a jockey. And then... Um, I was actually driving back for the race when the race was going on and my son called like halfway, they had the half mile pole and he calls me and froze my phone. So I actually didn't watch the race till like 10 o'clock at night because my phone blew up. <laughs> so, right, right. Crazy. And and what what was your son's recap or, or what, was he announcing the race here or was he just going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God? No, I had it I had it on TVG on my phone and he called me right. when he had up. And he started, he said, it's raining. And I'm like, well, no, he likes the mud. Don't worry about it. Hang up. I said, I got to go. Because so, you know, I'm trying not to get the phone interrupted. Because every time somebody calls, I have to reset it. And I was driving at the same time. And right. they, kicked the, they kicked the gates. And when he got to the first turn, nobody came over. I was thinking that you know, I said, this is good for him because he won't get no kickback if everybody stays out in the middle of the track. And I watched the races all day and everybody kept staying out off the rail. And Ramon just kept him down in there. I said, well, this is going to work out pretty good. And we get to the half mile and Ramon's just sitting with a lot of horse. And then my son calls me. And I'm not realizing, you know, they're that far ahead of us. He's just screaming on the phone. Like, we do. We just wouldn't rebel, you know. And he's just hollering and screaming. Right. Throws my phone. And then I just started getting texts and phone calls, like, for four hours after that. So I never got to watch the race till 10 o'clock that night. Mm. So then, what was that? What was that night like? Like, I, I can only imagine what it's like for someone like you to win that kind of race. How'd you celebrate? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Came no? home, kept trying to respond to people. Did a couple of interviews. Called Tony. You know, congratulate him, and you know, uh, just on the phone to owners, everybody else, friends. I, even the next morning, I was still texting people back from the night before that I didn't get to. I didn't get to call or text back. So it you was. Gotta- you got to take some kind of vacation, something like, come on, you got to, you got to live this up a little bit. No, this is 24 seven. We never get a vacation. <laughs> true. Yeah, true. That's true. Ricky, I've just got, I have another question for you. So, so if, if you were getting the horse back, does that automatically mean that the horse is going to the Arkansas Derby or do you think in the bluegrass? Cause you said you've shipped horses to Keeneland before. What, if, if it was up to you, what would, what decision would you make? Well, I think they're leaning more toward the bluegrass because uh, it gives them extra week. I mean, he ran twice in 21 days. So and he's a little knocked down right now. So he's at the barn here in Louisiana, just kind of freshening up. Uh, I think we're going to end up, you know, going to the bluegrass with him. Ricky Corville, the winner of the Rebel Stakes. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Congratulations again. Best of luck with him. All right. Thank, thank you, Ricky. 
The Green Group Yes of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV workout of the week this week is Emmanuel, who we're going to talk about in a little bit. Worked in company with graded stakes winner Muda Sabek at Palm Beach Downs on Saturday, going four furlongs in 48.05. It's a bullet work. Best of 32 at the distance. Undefeated Todd Pletcher trainee, who was the number one overall pick in our fantasy draft. Bit of an upset there by John, but he's obviously a major contender this Saturday in the grade two fountain of youth stakes. Probably going to be the favorite in that race. So we're all looking forward to seeing him run and, and seeing him step into that graded stakes company. There's a, there a little bit of a story in the past couple of months uh, Bill reported on. Uh, Michael Sanchez, who's a jockey at Parks, um, he was suspended for supposedly betting against his own horses. He, and then his lawyer said he had had this gambling problem and, and that was he, he wasn't trying to do anything nefarious. But Bill followed up on that and has some pretty interesting tidbits. Yeah, I'm scooping myself a little bit because I haven't written the story yet. Hopefully it'll be in tomorrow's paper. But I filed a Freedom of Information request to the Pennsylvania Racing Commission and got a hold of his betting records. Um, the lawyer said that this was he was on a, um, a, a gambling frenzy for December 23rd to uh, of last year to uh, January 3rd. So it, it, it's a very small period of time. Uh, but what I learned from that, first of all, is that um, a couple things. Uh, number one, I mean, he was betting crazy amounts of money. Uh, his his favorite bet was to bet like win and place on a horse. Uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, beyond him to bet 2,500 win and place. Uh, and in one race, uh, he bet $5,000 to win on a horse. Um, so, you know, he was, uh, he, you know, these are on the surface irrational bets, you know, just betting crazy amounts of money, uh, unless you're, you know, really a professional type of thing. Um, so the, the lawyer had said that that he was not at any point trying to stiff his own horses and cash bets by betting against him. Uh, by and large, he's right. Uh, there was a uh, hundred and six, I believe, separate bets that were made uh, during this period. Many of them on days and at places he wasn't even riding. I mean, one day he bet on turf paradise, which kind of tells you a little bit about his, his you know, what, what was going on there. Um, but there were days where he was betting the card, betting lots of races that he was riding, uh, primarily at Laurel and Parks. And I've got to take a, a second look at it, but I've come up uh, right now with at least six races. Now, six out of 106 is not a lot. So I understand that where he did bet against himself, including a couple where he did cash fairly sizable bets. Uh, so you have to try to figure out, and, and you know nobody knows other than Michael Sanchez himself, in those races, was he trying to win or did he realize, I, don't, I wanna win my bet here, I'm going to not try to win with so-and-so horse. Um, you know, that's it's a tough one. It's a gray area. Maybe you guys have, have firmer opinions on it. Uh, he got a 60 day suspension. I, I do think uh, that was a little light when, you know, if the lawyer didn't do a very good job pleading the case that, you know, please be sympathetic. He was battling depression. He did this as an outlet. Um, he probably should have been ruled off for life for even if he just one instance where he bet against his horses. But, uh, you know, so uh, we've learned a little bit more about this, uh, answered some questions. 
And I guess the headline of my story was um, was going to be something in the effect: Michael Sanchez bet heavily and sometimes against himself. Yeah, I was actually on last time, Bill, when we were talking about this, and I think at the time you had heard from the lawyer that he was only betting like a few hundred a race, which is still a sizable amount, but thousands is a lot different than that, especially if he's cashing in some of those races. It's hard to not look at that with a pretty skeptical eye. Yeah, the, the lawyer, Alan Pincus, I asked how much uh, he was betting, uh, if he could shed it. This is a long time ago before I got any of this. And was, uh, he, he just said, very. he just texted me back, said he's bet a couple hundred a race. Well, th that's not at all true. I mean, occasionally he would make, you know, 25 win in place, something like that. But, you know, this is a guy who thought nothing of betting. I, he'd love to bet win place or win place and show. And, you know, would think of betting, would not uh, hesitate to bet 2,500 across on his horse. Uh, he was on a horse, not a horse that he necessarily rode. And a couple times he did actually bet on his own horse. Now, again, I have to go back. There was one race that I found where he bet horse A, rode horse B, and he actually won the race and the horse he bet on finished second. Now, that's, you know, that would, would tend to exonerate him or, or uh, lend some credence to, to the lawyer's theory. But there was a problem with that. In that race, he only bet a hundred win place and show, a three hundred dollar bet. It was, and he was, you know, perfectly capable of betting five, six thousand dollars on a race. So I don't know. Does that go through his mind that okay, if I win the race, I'm only going to cash a little bit here on this horse, not a lot of money. So uh, excuse me, if I, if the other horse wins, um, you know, again, we, we can't read his mind. We don't know the answer. But this is a this is a tough one. I, I really do understand both sides of the story. The only thing I would say is I, I think maybe a six month suspension probably would have been a, a little bit more appropriate. And we also have the fact that he bet against his own horses in Maryland and in uh, only Pennsylvania Racing Commission has done anything yet. Um, the Maryland Racing Commission could still jump in on this and, and say, uh, you know, OK, we don't care what Pennsylvania did. We're giving you an extra year or two years or something like that. So, you know, may, we may, may not have heard the end of this. Yeah, I mean, it's a little surprising that, like you said, he only got that suspension. Pete Rose got banned for life from baseball for supposedly betting against his own team. And he was just, I know, I don't know, he was the manager. I know the manager has some kind of effect on the game in baseball, but the jockey has a very direct effect on the horse. Um, I wonder, Bill, did you watch any of those replays? Could you see if he was... No, I haven't had a chance yet. I looked at some of the charts and I will watch him. Joe, I want to correct you on one thing. Pete Rose never bet against the Reds. He always bet on his own team, which goes to show you how much more seriously baseball took this than horse racing. You could not ever accuse Pete Rose of trying to lose because he always bet on the Reds. Isn't that what you said, though? Could they, have they proved that? That's yes, I, I believe they have. So the Michael Sanchez bet he did the equivalent of betting against his own team yeah. in these races. Again, only six, maybe there'll be seven, I'll, I'll take a look, but only six races out of 106. They are right about this. He was not doing this thinking, going into every day at every track thinking, I'm going to hold all my right. horses and I'm going to bet against them. Yeah. That didn't happen. It seems to me, Just as the lawyer said. Yeah, it seemed to me more like he just happened to be betting the races that he was riding, considering how much he's exactly, betting yes. elsewhere. Yes. Yeah. You know, maybe you can get him on your new betting podcast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Don't spoil the next guest. <laughs> Speaking of betting, always a good bet to get involved with a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtb.com. West Point enjoyed a big weekend with several winners led by greatest stakes winner first captain who's a TDN rising star. Won his first start since last summer at Gulfstream on Sunday. Seems like he had a little bit too much to do, but he was able to get up at the wire. Very, very exciting horse. When the the Dwyer last year was really highly regarded last summer. Really interested to see what he does as a four-year-old. He also had Elector and Unbridled Mary both in the winner's circle at Santa Anita for John Sadler. And then QF75 broke his maiden at Gulfstream on Sunday for Christoph Clement. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the Bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. 
being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I wanna see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can, because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Legacy has two past graduates who are beginning their stud career this year. Capo Kane was bought out of the Keeneland January sale in 2019. It's now standing at Bonner Hill Farms in Pennsylvania. And Sleepy Eyes Todd sold at the Keeneland November sale in 2016. Stands this year at Swifty Farms in Indiana. We look forward to seeing Tommy and Wendy this summer as well at the yearling sales. Brief update on the three-year-old fantasy contest. Uh, Sue Finley had a winner over the weekend, Pinehurst, and she was very excited in the group chat that she's gotten on the board in our contest. Yet, he got no points. Okay, first of all, Joe, I'm always listening. I already had five points, so I was already on the board. Yeah, and I've, been, right. I've been totally hosed. I deserve 50 points for that win. We're going to the UAE Derby, and I'm going to crush you all with your leftovers. That's my plan. Well, I honestly, first of all, Bob Baffert's horses shouldn't get any points at all for our contest, but we're, we're bending the rules for that. But then, yeah, you did, you did kind of get screwed. I wonder how long that, that race has to stick around in order for it to be a Derby points race. Because the UAE Derby is a points race, right, guys? Absolutely. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's yeah. a big one, too. It's a 100-point race, isn't it? Oh, man. It's all me. All Was he me. staying? Is Pinehurst staying in Saudi Arabia? Is he coming back? Do we know? I don't know, but I know that that's what he's targeting next. Okay. All right, Sue, so don't worry. You're definitely going to beat us with the scraps team. I am already, I've already resigned myself to that fact. It's going to be glorious. Okay, so also we this weekend we have some great actions. There's going to be a lot more points up for grabs this weekend. We have three graded stakes for the three year olds: the Fountain of Youth at Gulfstream, the Gotham at uh, at Aqueduct, and then the San Felipe at Santa Anita. I think we also the Bataglias this weekend as well at, at Turfway, and I think that has some points uh, attached to it as as well. Uh, I think the the best race by far is the Fountain of Youth. Honestly, the whole card at Gulfstream on Saturday is absolutely incredible. Uh, they have eight graded stakes races, um, a very a few very live looking maiden races, well maiden special weight races. Uh, Santa Anita also has six graded stakes, so I think there's 15 stakes total between Santa Anita and and Gulfstream. They're calling they're calling it first Saturday. It's the first racing that's that they race under under that banner. But the Fountain of Youth is an incredible race, full field, six stakes winners. I think it's even better than the Risen Star. You got a manual. And you got Rattle and Roll and High Oak making their three-year-old debuts. Mo Donegal in due time, simplification. Howling time looks like he's been working up a storm for Dale, Dale Romans. Uh, just some thoughts from you guys on the Fountain of Youth and this this big card on Saturday. Yeah, I totally agree. It's a better race than the San Felipe out at Santa Anita. Definitely. Um, definitely, you know, very, very deep field. Uh, a couple storylines. Mo Donegal post-12. Oh, at mile 16th at Gulfstream. That is going to be very, very difficult for him. Um, and, you know, is John uh, Green a genius picking Emmanuel first when he probably could have got him in the third round or something? Um, that was, you know, when I kind of chided John about that. It wasn't that I don't like Emmanuel. It's like, you know, it's like uh, instead of taking Trevor Lawrence with the first pick, you take some offensive lineman from uh, Wichita State because you're just, you know, that smart, you know, type of thing. So, um, but he's a very good horse. He's got to step it up a little bit in the speed figure range off an allowance win at, at Tampa Bay Downs. Um, and, you know, uh, Simplification ran a really good race in the Holy Bowl where, you know, he's a speed horse, didn't break well, and still finished second for an, trainer Antonio uh, Sano. Uh, that's going to be big. And uh, in due time, I know Brian is helping out the team at Edge Racing, and uh, he's coming off a huge win last time out for Kelly Breen. Paco Lopez aboard, John Green's favorite jockey. Totally agree. Rattle and roll as well. First start since the Breeders' Futurity. I think, John, um, excuse me, Joe, you're, you're right. We're going to learn more from this race than we've learned from any of the preps coming into it. And, you know, there's going to be two or three left standing after this, and then two or three top contenders you can just put a big X through if they run seventh or eighth in this kind of spot. So uh, very interesting. Um, out at Santa Anita, I'm interested in Forbidden Kingdom. 
for uh, Dick Mandela um, because I picked him in the rotisserie draft, in the fantasy draft. Um, yeah, back to the Florida race. I think we'll, there's some chance I think Mo Donegal might scratch. I guess we'll see. Um, there have been some chatter about that with the post. There's like a really short run up um, to the first turn. And, you know, they might wait for another race or maybe even just wait for the wood. Um, like Bill mentioned, I am working for Edge Racing. Uh, in due time is doing great. Um, he kind of burst on the scene. You know, we, the reports had been that he was training really well, kind of leading up to this year. Um, and then he just had that huge blowout win last time against those two Pletcher horses um, and kind of catapulted himself uh, onto the Derby Trail and uh, really, like, hasn't missed a beat since then. I'm kind of just super excited to see what he can do. It seems like he might even have another step forward in him. It's going to be interesting to see who the favorite in this race is, too. The morning line, Mo Donegal is a 3-1 to favorite. I don't think that that would be the case even if he does run. I think it's going to be Emmanuel. I just think there's so much buzz behind him that you know, I don't know if he's going to be a heavy favorite because it's a big enough field and there's enough other words, other places to go. Uh, but I, I could see him at like 5-2 to two or 3-1, to one, in which case I think he would be a, a pretty strong bet against. Um, but, yeah, lots lots of action. I Actually, I have in due time in the contest. I believe uh, Al has – Simplification. Um, John, I think, has Mo Donegal and Emmanuel. Uh, so there's a lot of lot of action for the contest this weekend. And like I said, great, great card at Goldstream. You definitely should get involved, and, and we'll be back next week to, to break it all down. Okay, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder about that Keeneland Spring Meet coming April 8th through the 29th. Make sure to log in and sign up at KeenelandSelect.com to get that bonus. I want to thank Bill Finley, Brian DiDonato, our Green Group guest of the week, Ricky Corville, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.